I got some semi smiles there for the four of you with your cams on. <laughs> well, was y'all able to have the other class today? Were there still issues? Went okay? Good. Good. Mr. Donahue, just for this class, can we have can we do it on Zoom? We won't tell nobody. <laughs> um, I wish I could say yes, but for now, I've got to mind my P's and Q's because I've already got in big trouble for using it. But let's see, okay? <laughs> Let me see if I can work my magic and get them to ease up a little bit. Make it a lot better. It amazes me how laggy this thing is. That is really aggravating. We almost got everybody here.
Did everyone get the worksheet I sent out earlier? Your email? Good. Okay, guys, bear with me. I'm just getting all your faces pulled up here. Okay. All right, everyone can hear me okay? Audio is okay? We good to go? Excellent. All right, so let's jump right back into it, everybody. This was a slide we left off on last time. So we're going to talk a little bit more about some of these joints located in the hand and the wrist, as well as the elbow. We're going to rename some of the element X, actually classify them based on those joint classifications that we did go over in that first chapter last week. So looking at these very first ones here, we have, once again, our distal interphalangeal joint and our proximal interphalangeal joints. So those are all classified under that ginglimus or hinge-type joint. As IP joints, either the distal interphalangeal or proximal interphalangeal, one through five, all five, whether they're distal or proximal, fall under the ginglimus or hinge-type joint classification. Moving a little bit more proximal at our MCP joints, which if you remember is the metacarpophalangeal joints, one through five of the MCP joints are all classified as ellipsoidal or condyloid type joints. So as IP joints are the hinge or ganglomus, the MCPs are all ellipsoidal or condyloid classified joints. Now, as we move a little more proximal towards our carpal bones, if you remember that connection point between the carpal bones and the metacarpal bones are identified as our carpo-metacarpal joints, or CMC joints. Now, be careful on this one because joints two through five, 
of the metacarpal, I'm sorry, the carpal metacarpal phalangeal joints are of the plain gliding type joint classification. But the first CMC joint, which is aligned with the thumb, by the way, the first digit, is going to be the only one that is a cellar or saddle joint. So that first CMC joint has a distinct difference from those other CMCs, and that is the only one that is a cellar or saddle joint. Two through five of the CMCs will all fall under that plane or gliding type joint. It's a real easy mistake to make there. Be careful. That first one will be cellar. Two through five will be plane or gliding type. And then finally, when we just move to the, to the carpal bones themselves, in between each of those eight carpal bones is what we're going to have called a, an intercarpal joint. And that's going to fall under the plane or gliding type classification. Plane or gliding type. They actually glide amongst each other as we move our wrists, rotate up and down, side to side. So our, those are our major joints and our major joint classifications for that hand and wrist specifically. So be very careful with that first CMC. It falls under cell or saddle. Two through five CMCs going to be plane or gliding. So we move down approximately to the radius and the ulna. We do have the radiocarpal joint that's found literally in between the radius, which is right here. Let me see if I can get a drawing tool. Here. It's right here. That's going to be our radiocarpal joint. as the connection between the radius and the carpal bones right above it. Radiocarpal joint. It is a synovial and a diarthroidal joint, and it falls under the classification of ellipsoidal or condyloid. Ellipsoidal or condyloid. That is that radiocarpal joint, the connection point between the radius and the carpal bones. Okay, so when we go all the way proximal to the elbow, the elbow itself is going to be a synovial or diarthrodial joint. And those two main joints that we're talking about there, we have the elbow joint itself, which is going to fall under the ginglimus or hinge type classification. But we also have that proximal radio ulnar joint where the radius and the ulna come together. That's going to be a trochoidal or pivot type joint. So elbow joint, which is the humerus, connected with the radius and the ulna is a hinge or ginglinous type. And that proximal radial ulnar joint is going to be the trochoidal or pivot type joint. That allows us to rotate our forearm, essentially. And both those are under that synovial diarthroidal classification as well. Can you explain that again, sir? Yes, yeah, so the elbow joint is going to be a ginglimus or hinge type joint. The proximal radial ulnar, which is where the radius and the ulna come together near that elbow, is going to be a trochoidal pivot type joint, which allows us to rotate our forearm in circular motions from left to right. Both of those joints, the elbow joint and that proximal radial ulnar joint, are classified as synovial, and they both are diarthrodial. Diarthrodial. They have a free range of motion. You know what diarthroidal means, free range of motion. Okay, so as far as wrist movements, if we do that onar deviation wrist movement, which is referring to rotating our wrists bending it towards our pinky finger, essentially, in this direction. We're ulnar deviating. We primarily do that wrist movement whenever we ever want to have a nice x-ray of our scaphoid, specifically. Ulnar deviation sometimes goes by the name of scaphoid projection. 
The primary reason we would ever do an ulnar deviation x-ray would be primarily looking at that scaphoid carpal bone. So if you remember, the scaphoid is the most frequently fractured carpal bone out of all eight carpal bones. The alternative method that we might do, depending on what we want to see, would be a radial deviation, as if we rotate our hand towards our thumb, towards our radius, because the radius is located underneath the thumb. We would do that movement for an x-ray if we're primarily wanting to visualize the lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, and hamate, those four carpal bones specifically. That's why we do a radial deviation. Very rarely done, because those carpal bones do not get broken too often. Like I said before, the scaphoid is the most frequently fractured, so you're more likely to do an ulnar deviation in the clinic as opposed to that radial deviation. But should they have those other carpal bones fractured, they would, opt, they would opt for that radial deviation instead of the ulnar deviation. And just another thing to make note of here, guys, if we're doing that ulnar deviation, whenever we bend our wrist towards the pinky and the ulna, that's what we call a medial movement. Versus if we do that radial deviation where we bend our wrist towards the thumb and the radius, that is a lateral movement. Lateral movement. And the reason for that is that may not make sense because you're looking at yourself right now, like when I turn my hand inward like this, isn't that medial? We're basing that on anatomic position. Anatomic position where the palms will be outward. Therefore, if I bent my wrist towards my radius in an anatomical position, that's a lateral movement. If I bend my wrist towards my ulna, that's a medial movement. Does that make sense? We're basing that on anatomic position. So I'll let that fool you because most of the time you do these on the table in a PA, and that can be confusing is the way you're looking at it. But we still base it purely upon that anatomic position. So for forearm rotational movements, two things here. When we have our forearm in the supination position, which would kind of be like anatomical position with the palms out, if I have my forearm straight out in front of me with my palms up, that is a supination. The radius and the ulna are separated with a division down the middle, which you can see right here. That nice, clear space in between that radius and ulna, that's when the forearm is in supination. But in reverse, if I pronate my forearm, the radius and the owner are actually going to cross on top of each other, reducing that space. That space is going to be non-existent, like you see in that picture on the right. So in pronation, the radius and the owner cross over each other. In supination, the radius and the owner are separated with a space in between both. And that's actually very important when we get to positioning for x-rays. Because one thing to make note of is that unless it's impossible to get any other kind of x-ray, we will never do a pronated forearm x-ray. And the reason for that is, as you can see in the picture here, if those bones are crossed on each other, we're not going to get a clear representation of both those bones separated, and we could miss a fracture going on on the radius or the ulna because they are superimposed on one another. So if all, at all possible, we always are going to opt for that supination of the forearm. The only reason we would ever pronate the forearm for an x-ray is if it's just impossible to acquire that AP forearm. So what instance might there be an impossibility to acquire that? Let's say that the patient is in a cast. And there's just no way they can move their arm. And you have to get that pronated forearm. That's the only option you have. That would be an excuse to do a pronated forearm. But still, if we can acquire it in an AP, we want to do everything we can to acquire those forearms in the AP view. That is a preferred view. In fact, in x-ray period, there is not a PA forearm. Just because that's not a sufficient x-ray. Because we're going to cross those bones. That's just a last resort if we can't get that true supination. We always need that radius and ulna to be separated nice and clearly. Okay, so these three x-rays right here, these are three, this is a three-view elbow. We have an AP and two obliques. So think about our anatomy a little bit here. Let's look at the very center image. This very center center image, image is an AP view. This is an AP full. I'm sorry, AP elbow. Now, if I look over here to the left side, this is going to be a lateral rotation of my elbow, lateral oblique, lateral rotation. And the way I know that is I can really predominantly see this medial epicondyle. It's in profile, as a matter of fact. As I rotate my elbow laterally, the medial epicondyle 
is shown in profile very clearly. If I look over here on the right, this would be a medial rotation oblique of the elbow. And the way I know that is that the radius and the ulna begin to cross upon each other right here in that distal aspect of the forearm. And the way I know this is an AP is I have this nice, clear, beautiful space between my radius and ulna that tells me that arm's in a true AP. Both epicondyles are in profile as opposed to the one over here on the left. So this would be... I'm sorry, it's so hard to write with this cursor. Oh. Oh, I got a laser pointer. I just discovered that. This is a lateral rotation. This is an AP. And this is a medial rotation. So one more time. The way I know this is a lateral oblique, like the arm, the elbows rotate laterally, is because I can see the medial epicondyle in profile, or that funny bone we talked about. The way I know this elbow is in a true AP, I can see both epicondyles in profile, and I have a nice clear space between the radius and the ulna, and the proximal portion as we move distally. And the way I can tell this is a medial rotation elbow is that my radius and ulna begin to superimpose upon each other. So three indications of what kind of movement we have going on on that three-view elbow. There we go. Okay, so sometimes on x-ray, we will, we'll, we will see what's called a wrist fat strip. Now, more often than not, you cannot see these. These are very hard to visualize on an x-ray. So I would never ask you to label this on an x-ray because it's very rare to actually see them. But do be aware that sometimes people have more prominent fat strips that do show up on x-rays. And these are the locations, or, or rather, this is the location where you would find that fat strip. We have what's called a scaphoid fat strip. It's literally located right next to the scaphoid, which is right here and right here. And then we have what's called a pronator fat strip. That's found anterior to the radius and the ulna, which you see on this lateral. You're only going to see the pronator fat strip on a lateral wrist. You're only going to see the scaphoid fat strip on a PA or oblique wrist. And very rarely, even then, you might not, you're probably not going to notice it or see it because it's actually very hard to visualize those on x-rays. But they are there. Let's go ahead and label them and identify them. For me, personally, I would not ask you to label one of those on an x-ray for an image of you. It is very rare to see those. Just be aware that they do exist and know where their location is. Scaphoid fat strip is right next to the scaphoid. Pronator is anterior to that radius and ulna near the wrist. Okay, and then we do have a few fat pads that are present near the elbow as well. Same concept, very hard to visualize on an x-ray. Some people, it's more predominant than others. We do need to know what they are, where they're located, but as far as labeling on an x-ray, same thing, I would not ask you to label these on an elbow because it is very, very rare to actually see these very clearly. Even with these outlines, if I took these outlines away, you would barely be able to make those out. But as far as the fat pads that are present on the elbow, we have what's called the anterior fat pad, which is at C here. The anterior fat pad is anterior to the humerus on a lateral view of the elbow. We have the supinator fat strip, which is located anterior to the radius on this lateral elbow. And then behind the radius and the ulna, we have what's called the posterior fat pad because it is located posterior to the humerus as well as posterior to the olecranon process of the ulna right here. And speaking of which, before I move on here, can anybody see something wrong with that x-ray? Does anybody see some pathology? Anybody notice what's going on there? It's what, what it is fractured right there at the ulna as you can see right here. 
there's a very nice fracture close to that olecranon process along that trochlear notch, splitting that in two pieces. We're going to go over these type of fractures in a little bit more specifically. I've got some more examples to show you. Okay, so uh, let me quiz you real quick on a few of the things we talked about. Who can tell me? I just mentioned this a while ago. What's the most frequently fractured carpal bone in the wrist? Scaphoid. The, the scaphoid. That is the most frequently fractured carpal bone of all eight. All right, a little more complicated here. The third carpal bone on the proximal row from the lateral aspect of the wrist, in other words, you're going lateral to medial, would be what? Right, Rachel. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze. Excuse me. You said triquetrum? Yes, sir. You are correct. It is the triquetrum on that proximal row, which is that lower row on the wrist, third one. Okay, the ulnar notch is located at the what? Ulnar notch. Does anybody remember? Proximal end of the radius? Will be the medial aspect of the distal radius. That's a very, very, very small piece of anatomy. That's not one I'll ask you to identify, but do make sure you know the location of it, even though we're not going to identify it on x rays. If I was to ask you in a textual format, that on our notch is on the medial aspect of the distal radius. It's where that on is going to fit into the, ra into the radius and form that joint space. All right, which of the following structures is located on the distal humerus? The distal humerus. Capitulum. The capitulum or the capitulum. You can say either way, by the way. So the other three choices there, styloid process is located on the distal radius and the distal ulna. They each have their own styloid process. The electronon process is located on the posterior aspect of the ulna. Coronoid process is also located on the posterior aspect of the ulna, forming that trochlear notch between the coronoid and electronon process. And the capitulum is a unique piece of anatomy found primarily on that distal aspect of the humerus. Right next to that capitulum would be the trochlea. Trochlea. The MCP joints are classified as which kind of joints? Ellipsoidal? It's going to be ellipsoidal, correct. Ellipsoidal. Make sure you remember both those names because I can throw either one. The plain names plus the scientific names. The IP joints or interphalangeal joints are classified as which kind? Ginglimus. The ginglimus, or what's the common name for ginglimus? If we're going to use the alternative name, or the the action yeah. make, what kind of movement would that be? It'd be a hinge-like movement, uh, moving those IP joints. So hinge or ginglimus. Okay, true or false? The distal radius will cross over the ulna when the hand is pronated. True. true. That is true. That is true. Just a little, little bit extra words in there. Just trying to see if you're paying attention. It doesn't matter if I say distal or proximal guys on that, or even midsection. The radius will cross over that ona when that forearm is pronated. So no matter what area of that radius and ona I'm asking about, if that hand is pronated, if that arm is in pronation, those two bones do cross over each other. Okay, so we're going to get a little bit into positioning here. We're going to talk about some different positioning aspects, and then we're going to move on to doing some anatomy review together. On some of this anatomy, make sure it's nice and fresh on your mind. We're going to go with that worksheet together. So positioning considerations for our upper limbs. This does apply to all the upper limbs that we're going to go over in this chapter. Every single one of them is going to be at 40-inch SID. Very easy to remember. We're not doing anything at 72. Every single projection we're going over on the upper extremities 
In fact, I'll go even further. Every projection that you're going to that you're going to learn this semester is going to be at 40 inch SID. So you don't ever have to worry about any of those 72 inch SIDs. Everything we're doing this semester is 40 inch SID. We of course got to have gonadal shielding. Some people will ask for more. If they do ask for more shielding, you can give them that nice lead jacket to cover their whole chest and neck. But gonadal shielding would be the minimum that we want to go ahead and provide for those patients. Four-sided collimation should be done when possible. The reason for that, we are dealing with much smaller body parts. Therefore, if we leave that collimation wide open, we're going to decrease that quality and increase the dose. So, for example, for a finger, I want that nice, nice, small collimation so that finger is just going to light up on that x-ray. If I leave my collimation field wide open, the finger is going to become muted, washed out. It's not going to have that nice, fine detail that I'm looking for on these upper extremity exams. The long axis of the part should be to the long axis of the IR. In other words, if you have a long body part, you should make your cassette lengthwise to accommodate for it. And the patient ID and side marker should be visible. We don't have to worry about those anymore. That's old school on x-ray, but that's talking about a little block marker, which you see right here on this cassette. Used to, back in the old days, they would put these little markers that had patients' names on them. And you'd have to be wary of where you're positioning that for an x-ray because it could cover up anatomy. So you don't have to worry so much about that last one. That's a very old school statement. Because these days with the digital x-rays, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Okay, a few more things here, guys. Three positioning principles. Our parts must be parallel to the IR. The CR must be 90 degrees to the part and the IR, and we must utilize correct CR centering. If that doesn't make any sense right now, we're going to go over that more specifically when you get to the actual specific position. So don't focus too much on that yet. Just know those are what we call the three positioning principles when we're considering doing x-rays on trauma patients specifically. This is for trauma patients specifically. I don't think I said that at first. Trauma patients specifically. We are going to go more into detail on that and explain exactly what we're talking about there when we get to it. For exposure factors, we must utilize a medium KV range, that's KVP specifically. That range should be from 50 to 75 on analog, which would be CR, computer, computer radiography. If we're using digital equipment, that KV range is going to be 55 to 80. And when we get to each of those body parts once again, we're going to specify what the exact KV range should be per body part. And we do need to go ahead and start memorizing those KV ranges. That is very important to getting quality x-rays on these upper extremity exams. We are gonna always utilize what's called a short exposure time. When you do set these techniques on the control panels, KV and mass, there is a seconds key. We wanna utilize the lowest amount of time to get a nice quality image. If we use a long time on these upper extremities, it's gonna burn them out. We won't really visualize them very well at all. We're also gonna use what's called a small focal spot. That is another button that we do push on the control panels. That's telling the machine that this is a small body part. It's going to make the necessary adjustments to, de to deliver that quality image that we're looking for on those small upper extremities. As far as patient care, when we're ever dealing with a fracture, we're always going to provide support above and below the fracture site. If you ever had a broken arm, broken bone anywhere on your upper or lower extremities, as you know, it's very hard to support that yourself. You don't want that hanging off of anything. You want to provide that proper support to reduce the amount of energy that can occur, as well as that's going to help you get a more quality image. If that patient isn't screaming and hollering and freaking out from the pain because, like I said, if you've ever broken a bone, it is not very fun. It's very painful. And some of these fractures do get quite severe. We're going to go over the types of fractures here in a little bit. Some of these fractures are actually coming outside the skin, bleeding all over the place. So we got to make sure we provide that proper support for each of those types of fractures. We can help our patient out, make them as comfortable as possible, because just to give you a warning, these people are going to come in with their fractures on their arms. Their arm's going to look like it's shaped like an S because it's so badly fractured, and they will not have any pain meds given to them. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. So we got to make accommodations for that to make them as comfortable as possible in the circumstance, which can be quite difficult. I don't know if any of you have done fractured arms yet. It can be quite a challenge if that patient does not have pain meds, and they're less willing to work with you because they are in so much pain. 
Okay, if we are doing an x-ray on an upper extremity and the patient has a cast, and I apologize, it's a little hard to read. If they do have a cast, we have to do what we call cast conversions. In layman's terms, what this means is that we're going to increase our KV, KVP on the control panel by a certain amount. Because when it comes to a cast, we're adding an extra layer on top of that skin. We have to penetrate through more layers to get to the bony anatomy and visualize it on an x-ray. So we do utilize what we call cast conversions. And we have three major types of casts listed right here. We have the small to medium dry plaster casts, the large or wet plaster casts, and the fiberglass cast. Depending on what kind of cast that is, and this is where critical thinking comes in because we have to pay attention to this, if, one, if a patient does present with one of these types of casts, you've got to raise your KVP by this range that I have listed here to accommodate for that extra layer and be able to visualize the anatomy better. Because cast x-rays are notoriously very ugly, especially when we see these fiberglass casts. They are not radiolucent at all. They show up quite badly. But they've got to provide that extra bit of penetration power to be able to penetrate through that cast hopefully get as good a visualization of that fracture as we can in the surrounding bones and areas. So for small to medium dry plaster casts, we're going to raise that KVP by five to seven, exactly. If they have a large or wet plaster cast, we're going to raise that KVP eight to 10. If they have a fiberglass cast, we're going to raise that KVP by the lowest amount, of three to four KV. And even then, it's still going to be pretty ugly on an x-ray. You're going to see that when you do x-rays on casts, but this does help a little bit as far as giving a much better quality image to accommodate for that cast showing up very badly on that x-ray. Mr. Duncan, you have a question. Oh, uh -huh, sure. Um, my mom, a while ago, she broke her wrist, and whenever she went to go get it checked out, the tech... He removed her cask to take the x-rays. Are we we're going to be doing that, or is mm. that like doctors? I, I am glad you brought that up, because the general rule to that is you never remove a cast or sling unless you have direct permission from the doctor first. Now, you will see some techs out there. Go ahead and do it. That can create a very big liability issue. If, for example, you were to remove that cast or sling and you further injured the patient's arm, like you broke it even worse before getting permission. So anytime you're faced with that situation, guys, do not ever take that cast or sling off unless you've talked to the physician first and they say it's okay just to cover you in case something was to happen. So even if you're going to see techs out there do it by themselves. Don't ever put yourself in that situation. That can, cause a, that can cause a lawsuit, essentially, because if you were to break that arm worse because you didn't really know what you were doing, as you can imagine, that would cause a lot of malpractice suits coming your way. So always get permission first. Thanks for bringing that up. That's a great thing to bring up. Okay, a little bit of trauma terminology here, guys. We are going to go over some different trauma cases and different pathologies that you will see in relation to upper extremities specifically. So first one here, we have what's called a dislocation. Most of you know what a dislocation is. That's when the, the there's a displacement from the actual joint, such as if the elbow is dislocated, the humerus becomes dislodged from that joint space where the radius and ulna is located. That's a very common um, displacement of joint dislocation. Another very common one would be the humerus in the shoulder. We'll talk about that next chapter. Obviously, anywhere there's a joint, there can be a dislocation. The fingers can become dislocated. All those different joints we've talked about can result in dislocation if that injury is severe enough. Now, we also have what's called a subluxation. So don't mix this up with dislocation. A subluxation is only a partial dislocation. In other words, only one part of that bone is dislocated while the other one's still in place. So a dislocation is a total displacement. A subluxation is a partial displacement. A sprain. Does anyone ever hear sprain their wrist or sprain their ankle? I have. That hurts. So what is that exactly? That is a rupture or a tearing of the connective tissues. It's not a bone that's been dislocated or broke. That's a rupture or tearing of connective tissues. Sprains do hurt. I've heard, I mean, I've never broken a bone, so I can't really say, but I hear sprains hurt worse than broken bones. That's what I'm told. I have sprained my ankle a few times before. It was very, very painful. And that fourth one you see there is a contusion. You'll hear them throw this term out a lot when you're in the hospital. A contusion is simply, guys, a bruise. If you have a bruise anywhere on your body, that is a contusion. And that 
is without fracture, without fracture specifically, just a plain old, old fashioned bruise is a contusion. Now talking about fractures, we do have a few that we're gonna go over here. We're gonna start with what's called a simple or closed fracture. And I do have pictures to show you what these look like in just a minute here. A simple or closed fracture is just that. It's a very, very minor fracture where the crack in the bone is within the skin still and it has not separated yet. It's essentially still closed. So it's essentially, to put it simply, it's a crack on the bone. You have a hairline fracture. A hairline fracture is a simple or closed fracture. Versus a compound fracture. That's going to be an open fracture where the bone actually comes apart. But something else with a compound fracture, that bone actually breaks through the skin. It breaks completely through the skin. That would be a more severe fracture, obviously, because we have bone coming out of the skin. Then we have what's called a comminuted fracture. A comminuted fracture is when the fracture is so severe that the bone actually splinters upon itself and becomes crushed. So if you ever see wood splinters, it looks just like wood splinters. Little shards of bone are going all over the place. It becomes crushed upon itself. And then the fourth major fracture you see there is what we call an impacted fracture. And that's simply when the fragments are driven into each other. So if two pieces of bone have separated and they're, they're being pushed into each other, that would be an impacted fracture. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Way to remember that. What's an impact? An impact is when two cars come together and hit. Like the two cars impacting. Think of two pieces of bone coming together, impacting, overlapping on top of each other. Like I'm doing my hands right here. That would be an impact fracture. So that's going to be the four most common types of fractures you will see when it comes to upper extremities, types of uh, anatomy we're talking about here in this chapter. Okay, so this is an example right here on the right of a closed fracture. It's a very simple hairline fracture. The bones are not separated. They're still closed. Thus, it's called that closed fracture. It's probably going to be the most common type of fractures you see. Most people that come in with a fractured, fractured wrist or fingers or arm, it's going to be those nice, simple hairline fractures where the bones are still connected, but there's a very prominent crack going across that bone. Sometimes not so prominent. Sometimes it's very hard to see. But that would be an example of a closed fracture, specifically on the head of the radius here. Come on. Come on, WebEx. There we go. Compound fracture. So once again, a compound fracture is when the bones have become separated and they're actually puncturing through the skin. We look here on the left, we have the ulna that's become completely separated from the wrist. It's actually coming out of the skin right here. Completely very painful, very hard to see if you've never seen one of those. Same thing over here. This is a forearm x-ray where we have the ulna actually coming out of the skin, this complete dislocation of that joint, it's breaking the skin. We have a complete fracture of the radius here as well, where this little shard of the radius is puncturing the skin as well. See down here. A little hard to see on that one. Whoops. Well, there we go. That's coming out of the skin right there. And this as well. It's those compound fractures. Okay, and then we have the comminuted fracture. That's where that bone's going to start fracturing. I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to be fractured, but it's going to start splintering and crushing upon itself. And it actually looks like a bunch of wood that's splintered. It's that key characteristic. It's actually splintered shards of that bone. Doesn't necessarily come out of the skin. That can be within the skin, as both of these show you. But that key feature is that we have those sharp shards that are splintering off the bone. 
it, it takes on a more crushed appearance overall. It's the comminuted fracture. That's the humerus there on the left that's been fractured. And of course, that's the elbow we've been talking about right here, primarily the ulna, which has splintered quite severely. And these can be very difficult x-rays to get. Let me ask y'all a critical thinking question for a second, because you're going to see x-rays come in like this elbow right here. And the doctor's going to ask you to get a true lateral elbow. Now, those of you that have been in lab, you know how to do a true lateral now, right? Where you put your arm on the table, you bend that arm at 90 degrees, you get that nice lateral elbow. Let me ask you this. If a patient came in and they have a common nude fracture or bone coming outside the skin, and they cannot rest their arm on that cassette because it's too painful. How would you get a nice true lateral elbow? Does anybody know? Use those critical skills for a second. Cross table? Exactly right. You would opt for a cross table. So that where, that's where it comes back to what I was talking about, about supporting their arm. Let's say their arm is very fractured like you see here on the right. And they have their arms straight out. They can't bend it because the elbow is completely splintered. At that point, you could put the cassette on the lateral side of the elbow over here, shoot across the table while someone's supporting that arm, and still get a true lateral elbow by shooting cross table. So that critical thinking comes in. That will happen a lot because, as you, I mean, I don't, it's a miracle they got the x-ray here on this picture. But most people are not going to be willing to bend that arm in that 90-degree angle their arms are going to be straight out because they can't move it. They can't support it. You have to build that arm up and shoot it cross table. Cross tables are always your best friend when a patient can't move their arm or limbs. And you need to get those nice, pretty laterals. So those doctors will never understand. They'll never understand. They always think that you can just work magic and get a perfect x-ray. Not that you can't. We're here to work magic. But they will expect that from you. Or they'll send them right back to try to get a better x-ray. And then here is that impacted fracture. If you remember what I was saying, that's where two bones impact upon each other and they slide either on top, beside each other, they become superimposed. You see right here, the head of the radius broke off and it slid downward and it superimposed upon the body of the radius right here. That's the view from the lateral showing you how it came displaced and moved downward. Same thing here, the radius and the ulna are becoming superimposed because of that impact type fracture. Those bones are overlapping on top of each other, are superimposed upon each other. Is that very hard impact of those bones? By the way, this is an example right here. If this was a forearm x ray, this patient could not move their arm. You can see that hand is pronated. So you see the race, the ulna crossing. This would be one of those exceptions where it would be acceptable to get that pronated forearm. But if there was any way to get that AP, it would still want to try to get that AP no matter what. This tech did not try that. They went ahead and did a PA. Okay, we do have a few more types of fractures we're going to hit here, guys. We have what's called an incomplete fracture. What that is essentially is whenever that fracture does not travel through the entire bone. It's just a small crack on one side of any bone that we're talking about. It cracks incompletely. A complete fracture would go all the way across. Incomplete would just be on the side and not be traveling across that entire bone. So that's an incomplete fracture. It does not fracture completely. It's only a partial fracture. Okay, we have what's called a boxer's fracture. Sure, some of you have heard of a boxer's fracture. It's called that because a lot of boxers acquire this fracture. That's going to be an exact fracture on the neck of the metacarpal, the neck of the metacarpal, or more specifically, kind of the body of the metacarpal. You have the head right here, right below the head's the neck. Where the neck or body portion of any of those metacarpals would be called a boxer's fracture. It's most commonly on that fifth digit, that pinky finger. That is going to be the easiest digit to break, by the way, the fifth digit or pinky finger. And obviously, those boxers, they're punching all day. It's what their career is based upon. They're going to present with these boxer fractures quite a bit. You have prisoners come in. They get into a fight in the, in the jail. Most of the time, they'll have these boxer fractures because they punch somebody. You know, 
Punching is not like it is in the movies. Most people that punch somebody really hard end up with a fractured arm, fractured wrist, or fractured hands. Uh, in the movies, they can punch people all day. But in real life, you punch somebody hard enough, you're going to break your hand, break your wrist. And most of the time, a punch is going to result in a boxer's fracture. We have a lot of teenagers when I was in Texas Children's that would come in from Juvie Hall. They would come in because they would get in fights at Juvie, and they would always have those boxer fractures because they'd punch somebody. They'd have to come get x-rays from us to make sure their hand was okay. Happened quite a bit. All right, two more here. We have what's called a Coley's fracture and a Smith's fracture. Now, this occurs when someone falls the wrong way. Let's say you were jumping on a trampoline. You went flying off the trampoline, you landed on your wrist with your palm down. That's the one on the left here. If you fell with your palm extended, with your palm down, you have a chance of fracturing that wrist. It's a distal radius posterior displacement. It's palm down, laying on your palms down. And the Smith's fracture is simply the reverse of that Coley's fracture. It's a distal radius with anterior displacement. If I was to land with my palm, the back of my palms, if I'd land that way, which I hope no one would ever land that way, that would be quite careless. That's going to result in that Smith's fracture. It's going to be an inward fracture versus the Coley's being an outward fracture. It all depends on which part of your hand you land on. And that does result most commonly in an impact type fracture that we talked about. Okay, we do have what's called an epiphyseal fracture. Now, epiphyseal fracture, if you remember, we talked about the epiphyseal plates, or what was the other name for that, guys? Do y'all remember? Maybe. Say again? Growth plates. Growth plates. So with that being said, what type of patient do you think would be the most common type to have an epiphyseal fracture? Children. Children. Say again, I couldn't hear you. Like infants, children. Pediatrics. Pediatrics will be the most common type to present with epiphyseal fractures, although it can happen in adults. It's very rare because the adults do have those epiphyseal plates fused. It's most commonly going to happen with children. Because that bone is not fully fused, it can become displaced if we have an impact that hits that patient in the wrong way. And then the final type we have here is a Salter-Harris fracture. A Salter-Harris fracture is simply a fracture on the base of the proximal phalanx. Fracture on the base of the proximal phalanx. And that can be in any of those digits, any of the five digits. It's on the base of that proximal phalanx. A little hard to see. There's a little crack going across right there. That'll be the Salter Harris fracture. You'll see it labeled as type two. There are different types. I don't expect you to know the different types. There's five types total. But just do make sure you make note that that Salter Harris fracture is a fracture of the base of that proximal phalanx. By the way, can you guys tell if this is a pediatric x-ray as well? Anybody notice that? There's our growth plates. And look at those carpal bones. They're not fully formed yet. What, what carpal bone is totally missing there, by the way? There's a couple missing, but which one is very clearly missing? Can you see it? The scaphoid. Scaphoid. Scaphoid should be right here. Scaphoids will be one of those last carpal bones to develop. There's no scaphoid at all yet. Look how small the trapezium is. Trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, handmates. Pisiforms missing. Triquetrum, lunate, scaphoids missing. It's kind of cute to see. It's kind of cool to see that. You see it on the little baby's hands, the little tiny carpal bones. They're like little circles. Okay, so let's take a break, everybody. Go ahead and take a, let's do a seven-minute break. We're going to reconvene at 154.
and we'll do some anatomy review before we move on to positioning. Make sure we're good to go. Seven minute break.
All right, guys, and as you're coming back, if you can get that worksheet pulled up, if you're able to print it, hopefully you were. If not, hopefully you can at least pull it up on your PC, computer, phone, so we can review this anatomy together. Okay, everyone can see this okay? Good to go? All right. So typically the way I would like to do this is we would usually do this in class where you take some time, work in groups, try to answer as much anatomy as you can by yourself, to quiz yourself. I do recommend you still do that when you can, especially when you're trying to study all this anatomy. If you can print these out, at all, please print them out and quiz yourself. Um, don't just look at the answers. It's probably the worst way to study. Do it without the answers and see how much you know so you know exactly what you need to focus on to prepare for the test. So we're going to just do this as a class. I'm going to go down the line with everybody. Just wait for everyone to get their cams back on. Sias and Sun, if you can put your cams back on. There we go, guys. Good. All right, Asias, can you hear me? Don't think Asias is logged back in yet. So we're going to go to Aurora. Aurora, I'm going to start with you. Yes. Yes, we're going to start at number one here. Aurora, one is referring to this entire bone right here as a whole. That's why it has that bracket. What would be the name of that anatomy that one is pointing to? If you don't know these, it's okay, guys. We're going to do this together. Just see where we're at so you know what to focus on studying. So, Aurora, what would one be? So, would one be the first metacarpophalangeal joint? So, close. So, the fifth metacarpal. The fifth metacarpal. Oh, what did I say? You said the fifth metacarpal phalangeal joint. So this is referring to the entire bone. This is going to be the fifth metacarpal. And, uh, okay. and that's okay. With we'll the actual interview, guys, when it comes to it. Go ahead, go ahead and mute if you don't mind. Yep, thank you. When it comes to the actual image review, I'm going to specify if I'm looking for a landmark, bone as a whole, or a joint. So don't worry too much about that. You will know what you're supposed to label. So, Amy, let's go to you. What would two be pointing to? Um, would that be the trapezium? Or... So be careful because this is actually backwards from what we're used to looking at. I put that there for a reason. It does reverse on the other hand. Is it the hammock? That would be the hamate, yes. So did you guys see that? You see how it actually reverses those carpal bones when we go to the other hand? So be very careful. Make sure you know what you're looking at. One thing I always do is I look at where the scaphoid is. And why? Because the scaphoid is easy to identify. It's under the thumb, and it has that very elongated shape. That way it's not going to throw me off when I'm trying to label all those carpal bones. So be very careful when you're labeling those. So Duyan, let's go to three. Duyan, what is three? Put three, I put triquetrum. Triquetrum, very good. That's the triquetrum. So right next, um, right underneath it, superimposed as bed A, what would four be? It's 
So what do you think it is? I'm, I'm kind of confused, to be honest, because I was looking at it backwards. I thought it was backwards. It's okay, and it is backwards from what we looked at on the PowerPoint, because it switches between the hands. The hands are mirrors of each other. I'm not sure, honestly. The smallest one. What would be the smallest? Pizzy form. That's the pizzy form. Pizzy form is always going to be superimposed on that triquetrum, and it'll be jutting out just barely. I'll make sure it's very clearly labeled for you guys if I do ask you to label that one specifically. All right, so let's go to Asias. Asias, what would five be referring to? Little point right there. Sias, can you hear me? Styloid process? Styloid process, very good. The styloid process of the ulna specifically. Styloid process of the ulna. Make sure you do specify what bone that is on because there's a styloid process of the ulna. There's also a styloid process of the radius. Okay, Daniel. Daniel, I, I missed you up there. What bone is seven referring to? Some of that whole bone, by the way. I think you're muted, Daniel. Radius. So try again. It's going to be the... Not the radius, but the oh, ona. Ona. So one way to remember is for radius and ona, when we're looking at the wrist, the radius is much wider. The ona is very skinny at the wrist. So the ona will be skinny. Radius will be wide. Okay. Mr. Donahue, what will be number six? Number six? Oh, I skipped six. I'm sorry. Well, tell me. Why don't you tell me what six is? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. I don't. I, I don't know is the wrong answer. It's <laughs> <laughs> so that's the one that's moon. Shaped. It's the moon shaped one. Moon, moon shaped. Lunate. The lunate. That's the lunate. That's number six. Right? Number six, correct. And seven is the uno. Correct. Thank you. All right, John. What would eight be? Distal portion, distal digit. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. The distal phalanx of the first digit or the, the second digit. There you go. Distal phalanx of the second digit. If I wanted to know the specific landmark, guys, that would be the body of the distal phalanx of the second digit. I'm just looking for the bone. You just simply tell me the distal phalanx of the second digit. And I will specify that on your test. So with that being said, Jalisha, I'm looking for the landmark on this bone for number nine. What would that be? Is it the middle body? The middle phalanx, the body of the middle phalanx of the second digit? Exactly right. Body of the middle phalanx of the second digit. Exactly. Good. Javier, same concept for number 10. What would be the landmark on number 10 that I'm referring to there? Can you hear me, Javier? Yep, I can hear you. Um, I want to say uh, that's the body of the... Proximal. Is it on the proximal? Yes. Uh, I don't know the I don't know the I don't know the rest. <laughs> you, got, wait, you got about halfway there. So that's the body of the proximal phalanx of the second digit. Body okay. proximal phalanx of the second digit. Okay, Jessly, what about eleven? I love labeling those. That's my favorite ones to label. I'm just saying. If you need a clue, you know it kind of looks like a seed. You know, a seed. I talked about those little seed oh, like. Sesame. I I I just about it's like sesame something that something like that. Bomb. Yeah, I don't so. know how to say sesamoid. 
Bones. Sesame oil. There you go. So, so don't write don't write sesame seed. Don't write sesame seed, but it will be the sesamoid bone. And you don't have to specify where that is. You just simply write sesamoid bone. Right. That specifically. Only that one specifically. Okay. Joe Lee, you are next. What 12, Joe Lee? Is this the tree design? Close. Not trapezium, but... Trapezoid. Trapezoid. And if you trapezoid. remember, guys... You're going to start with the trapezium. I comes before O. So 13 is trapezium. 12 is trapezoid. I comes before O. Always start with the trapezium, then move to the next one, which is trapezoid. Okay, I gave 13 away, but 14, Jonathan, what would 14 be? The scaphoid. For 14? Kimmy. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. That's the uh, capitate. The capitate or the capitan, El Capitan, I think that's what John said. That's the captain of the ship. That's the biggest one, the capitate, correct. And then, uh, Juan, let's see, you already went, Wani, so let's go to Sharon. Sharon, what is 15? It is scap scaphoid. Yes, it is. That is the scaphoid. Very good. So, Luke, let's go to 16. What would 16 be? Is that the styloid process of the radius? Correct. The styloid process of the radius. Thank you for being specific on that. Styloid process of the radius. Then 17, Maricela, 17 is referring to the bone as a whole. What bone is that? The radius. The radius. Very good. Very good. And we haven't went over positioning yet, guys, but if I asked you what position this is on this left one, this is a PA hand. PA hand. What was um, number 16? 16 was the styloid process of the radius. Okay, let's move to this image on the right where some of my arrows got a little messed up. I do apologize. Mr. Donahue? Yes. Just a quick question about uh, making sure that's the right one. So it said that it's the PA of the left hand? Well, there's no marker, so we can just say PA hands. But specifically, yes, that would be a PA of the left hand. When that marker's missing. But since there is no marker, you can simply put PA hands. So when you look, when you look at um, like a PA, you said that you have the, um, the radius go across the zone on the right. For a PA hand? Yeah. Is it right? For, for the pronation, so that pro, that crossing is going to take place a little bit more proximal towards the elbow. Okay. On the wrist, it is still going to look like it's open. I may, I may not have specified that correctly earlier, but yeah, it is to remain open at the wrist, but as you move more proximal towards the elbow, those bones will cross. Yes. Okay, I got you. Now, thank you for bringing that up. It's a good point to bring up. Let me go on to our next one here, guys. Here we go. So the position of this one, guys, oblique. we haven't went over this in the positioning aspect, but you have done this in lab. This is a right oblique hand. It's a 45 degree oblique of that hand. Anatomy is going to be similar, but it does lie a bit differently. So let's start at the very top here. Let's see, who do I leave off with? I think... Uh, Naomi, you look like you're next in line here. Naomi, this first arrow that I'm pointing to right here, what is that? That's a joint to be specific. That is the distal interphalangeal joint of the fourth digit. Very good. Distal interphalangeal joint of the fourth digit. And you can write the abbreviation, guys, D-I-P, a fourth digit, if you choose to. A little easier to remember, a little easier to spell. I would pick D-I-P, a fourth digit. But if you want to put the whole word, I'm not going to say no to that. I like big, long words, so give me the whole word if you want to impress me, see if you can spell it right. Okay, so Ruth. Ruth, let's go to this arrow right here. This is a landmark that I'm pointing to. So what would that be? 
that will be a body body of the middle finger. Middle yes, finger. you're correct. Body of the middle finger. Um, uh, a body of the middle phalanx. If no, 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 of the fifth digits. You got it exactly right. Good job. Good job. You got it. You got it. I know it's a mouthful there, but you got it. Good. Okay. Let's go to Pamela. Pamela, let's go to this joint right here on this arrow. It's a joint that I'm pointing to. What would that be? Um. So say it a little louder, I can barely hear you. Can you hear me? There you go, that's better. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, can you hear me? Oh, no. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's not answer. Um, it's not IP. Is it IP? Oh, you're close. You're close. I don't know. That's all right. So that's going to be the distal. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Not the distal. The proximal interphalangeal joint of the second digit. Proximal interphalangeal joint of the second digit, or the PIP of the second digit. So make sure you know the difference between that PIP versus that DIP. People get those mixed up quite a bit. So Shibu, let's go to you, Shibu. This is a landmark on this bone right here. What would that be? Interphalangeal joint of the first digit. So for joint, if I was asking for joint, yes. But for landmark, more specifically, that's going to be the head of the proximal phalanx of the first digit. Head of the proximal phalanx of the first digit. But you were correct if I was asking for joint. That would just be the interphalangeal joint of the first digit. All right, son. Up this round bone here. Let's cancel my favorite ones to ask. Uh, that's a sesamoid bone. That is a sesamoid bone. Very good. Stephanie, let's go to you. This is a landmark on this bone that I'm referring to. Is that the CMC of the second? Digit? No way. Or if I was asking for a joint, yes, but this is going to be a landmark on the bone. So you were close. If I, if I was pointing to a joint there and I label it as a joint, yes, it would be the second CMC. But for landmark on that bone, it's going to be the base of the second metacarpal. The base okay. of the second metacarpal. Okay, Tracy. Tracy, what is this arrow here referring to? It's a carpal bone, specifically. Are you counting this? Yeah. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Capitate. Capitate. That is the capitate the largest carpal bone. What was your question, Ruth? Yes, you said uh, that was the base of the second metacarpal. I Correct. Thought, yes, I thought uh, we're supposed to say like base of um, the proximal. No? We don't add any proximal. So for the metacarpals, we don't have to be quite as specific as with the actual digits. So for referring to the parts of the metacarpal, you can say the head of the second metacarpal, the body of the second metacarpal, or the base of the second metacarpal, simply like that. Yeah, you can make it a little more simple. When you're talking about the actual digits and phalanges, would you have to use that long phrase we've been using to be more specific? So what part we're talking about. Okay, let's go... Let's see. Let's see how our time's doing. I'm just going to go through the rest of these myself, guys, so we don't run out of time. You can have all the answers. So if I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down. But this next one right here, guys, is going to be the scaphoid. Scaphoid. Mm -hmm. 
This arrow over here is pointing to the triquetrum. Yishibu, if you don't mind, can you mute yourself? There's some background noise coming from your computer. The next arrow here, guys, is the styloid process of the ulna. Styloid process of the ulna. And then finally, this is the distal radio owner joint. Distal radio owner joint. And once again, in case you didn't get that's a right oblique hand. Right oblique hand. By the way, real quick, can anybody see the fracture on that x-ray? Can anyone see it? If you saw it, can you tell me where it is? Um, I want to say the first digit. You are correct. And where specifically on that first digit? <laughs> Right here, guys. You see it? The base of that first metacarpal at the CMC joint. There's a little fracture there. Just want to see if anyone caught that at that cellar joint. That cellar joint, to be specific. Saddle joint. Okay, let's go to this lateral hand. This is a lateral hand, a right lateral hand, to be specific. Now, this first one here, this first box is referring to the third metacarpal. But as you can see, these are superimposed. So I'd ask you for, an, if I asked you this on x-ray, I would ask you for the range of what we're looking at. You just basically tell me that's the metacarpals on that lateral only. That's the metacarpals. Why? Because they're superimposed. But if you want to be super specific, if you're wondering that is the third one I'm pointing to, but on the lateral hand only, and the metacarpals are superimposed, just simply tell me that is the metacarpals. And if it's a landmark, that's the body of the metacarpals. It's just that midsection of that metacarpal. With that being said, we can see the first digit quite well and the first metacarpal quite well. I'm pointing to the body of the first metacarpal here. Body of the first metacarpal. And these other four are going to be referring to carpal bones. Right here we have the capitate. This one's the capitate. Over here is the trapezium, right underneath the thumb there. The carpal bone underneath that would be our scaphoid. And finally, that nice moon-shaped carpal bone is going to be our lunate. The lunate. It looks like a moon right there. Yes, Donnie, what was the first one? Up here? Yes. That's going to be the metacarpals. And because they are superimposed, you can just tell me metacarpals. If I was looking for an exact landmark, you'd tell me the body of the metacarpals. Okay, thanks. Welcome. What was the one underneath that? Right here? That would be the body of the first metacarpal. Okay, let's go to this forearm image here. This is an AP forearm. AP forearm. And you will see this first one has two arrows. That's talking about a range of bones. That's going to be simply referred to as the carpal bones. because It's talking about that entire range of bones in the wrists, the carpal bones. If I had one arrow going to a carpal bone, it would specify exactly what that carpal bone is. But if you see a range of arrows, just like this, you can refer to it as a whole as the carpal bones. This first box right here is going to be the styloid process of the ulna. Styloid process of the ulna. On the right side is going to be the styloid process of the radius. Styloid process of the radius. This box right here is going to be the head of the ulna. 
There's also a neck of the owner there, but I want you to put head of no head of owner because the head of the owner is the more important portion of the piece of anatomy to memorize for that part. The neck is very, very tiny and very niche to label. This would be the head of the owner. Right here, guys, this box with this arrow is the body of the owner. If you move to the right, that is the body of the radius. Body or shaft, by the way, both terms would be correct, body or shaft. This right here is gonna be the radial tuberosity. Radial tuberosity, it's that little protrusion on the radius right here on the proximal portion. Underneath that is going to be the neck of the, ra of the radius, neck of the radius. We do see the neck of the radius quite clearly, so we will label that. And underneath the neck of the radius is going to be the head of the radius, right there at that elbow joint, the head of the radius. Okay, on this distal portion of the humerus, where that elbow joint connects, is the capitulum. It's the surface right here, the capitulum. Capitulum, say it either way. On the other side will be the trochlea. This is the trochlea right here. This box right here is pointing to the olecranon process. Olecranon process. And then this last one here is simply referring to the humerus. I'm asking for the bone, you can tell me that is the humerus. And once again, that is a right AP forearm. You said that uh, number 12 was a liquor non -press. This one right here, yes. Okay, thank you. Do you just identify, and you identify that as like a superimposed with nuclear? It is. With this image, you can see it outlined quite well. It's pointing to the tip right there, which is that most proximal portion of the ulna. That's going to be that electronon process specifically. But it is superimposed on the radio, on the humerus, yes. What was the last one? The very last one right here, that's going to be just the humerus. I'm going to go a little faster here, guys. I don't want us to run out of time. I got about eight minutes to get through these. This is a pediatric forearm here, by the way. This is a lateral forearm. Very bad lateral forearm because the wrist is not in true lateral. The main thing they're looking at is the elbow here. So let's start at the very top. We have the trapezium. Excuse me, trapezium. Over on this side, we have the hamate. Right underneath that with this arrow is going to be the styloid process of the ulna. This arrow right here is referring to this little line going across. That's going to be the epiphyseal plate of the radius or growth plate of the radius. You can use either term. Epiphyseal plate or growth plate of the radius. Down here by the elbow, this first arrow on the left is showing the coronoid process of the ulna. Coronoid process of the ulna. We 
Right below that, we have the superimposed epicondyles of the humerus. Superimposed epicondyles of the humerus. This arrow on the right side here, that I just highlighted, that's going to be the trochlear notch or sulcus. You can use either word, trochlear notch or sulcus. And this last arrow is pointing to the olecranon process of the ulna. Olecranon process of the ulna. And one more time, this is a right lateral forearm. Right lateral forearm. Let's go to our last image here, guys. Oh, I'm sorry, we got two more images. Let me hurry up here. We'll go fast. We'll go fast. So the first arrow here, guys, is the humerus. Second arrow. Electronon process of the ulna. Wow. Third arrow, medial epicondyle. The arrow right below is the trochlea. The arrow all the way down here is the radial tuberosity. Go back up here to the other side. This is going to be the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, by the way. Lateral epicondyle of the humerus. I didn't say that on the other ones. Those are of the humerus. The capitulum of the humerus. Capitulum of the humerus. Head of the radius. And finally, the neck of the radius. This is an AP for I'm sorry, AP elbow, AP elbow. Jesus. Yes. Let me go over this last image real quick here, guys. If you need me to go over these again, I'll be glad to. Just let me know, email, text, whatever you need me to do. I'll clarify it for you. This first arrow is the humerus. Second arrow right here is the epicondyles of the humerus superimposed. Superimposed epicondyles of the humerus. Right below that, we have the olecranon process of the ulna. Right here, we have the trochlear notch or the trochlear sulcus. Oh, this is my room. Right above here is the coronoid process of the ulna. Just that little spike there. And then our last two are going to be the radius, the top arrow, ulna, and the bottom arrow. And this is a right lateral elbow. Right lateral elbow. What were the last two? The last two, the top arrow is the radius and the bottom arrow is the ulna so a lot of anatomy guys a lot to start memorizing please get a jump start on memorizing this anatomy i am going to have more additional images to send you guys as we get closer to the test that image review next week we are going to review it as well over and over again as we go through the positions so don't worry it's going to start clicking but do yourself a favor start looking at this anatomy now Look at the diagrams, look at the x-rays, start committing it to memory. And if anything's needing some clarification, please let me know. I'll be glad to help. Are there any questions about what we talked about today? Or anything you need clarified before we log off for the day here, guys? Mr. Donahue, we still miss one image, right? Are we missing one image? Yeah, after lateral. Talk for the elbow? The third one. Oh, like the oblique, the oblique. I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share some of those as well as we go with the positions. Okay. Yeah, some more of those. I want to make sure you have all the positions to study. Yeah. On that last. Oh yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. Oh, Jay, on, on that last one, it, 
the last one where you, you, you said it was a core eye process, and just because it's the arrow's pointing a little bit further in, I, I, I thought it was the, the head. Yes. It's, yeah. So on that anatomy specifically, Jonathan, if I ask you guys to name that coronoid process, I will specify I'm looking for a process. And the reason for that is it is superimposed upon the head of the radius. And I don't want you to get the two mixed up. So I'll be very specific on what I'm looking for on that anatomy. Yeah. Um, okay. Got you. Go grab my keys and my wallet because we got to go as soon as this is over. For your doctors. All right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for class today. Just let me know if you have any okay. more questions. I'll be glad to answer them. It's two thirty. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thirty minutes away. And I will see you all real soon. Enjoy clinic tomorrow. Good luck. Come you back with some class? good stories. I'll see you guys on Friday. Yeah, Friday. I forgot what day of the week it is. Bye bye. We'll see you then on Friday, Thursday. Today's Wednesday. I don't have class tomorrow.